Father in heaven, we thank you for a weekend like this where we can come apart, we can open your word, and we can learn more about the very important message you have for your people in these last days. Thank you for Jesus Christ, the Lord, our righteousness. May he be lifted up in the presentations, and he will be lifted up in the presentations shared this weekend. May we be drawn to him, and may our experience in following him be different, be changed, be better after this weekend in this series, uh, after this series of meetings. Father, we pray for Pastor Mike Lambert as he shares and begins this series. And we pray that your blessing and your spirit would rest upon him. Speak to our hearts and our minds, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you and would like to send greetings to each one of you from your brothers and sisters in Christ from the State Line Church in the middle of the Walla Walla Valley. And to begin this evening, we want to be sure that you all have your Bibles ready. And as you're getting them ready, let me say this to begin our weekend together on Righteousness by Faith. The Bible is the fully inspired Word of God. It is the infallible revelation of His will, the authoritative revealer of doctrine, and the Bible is the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. So what do you say? Let us prayerfully and humbly read and study the Bible more, for in it we will find hope for every crisis, but more importantly, we will find our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died to redeem us from our sin. Will you pray with me? Father, we now take time to open the sacred scriptures, and we ask that as we open your word, you would open our minds and teach us simple Bible truth. In the worthy and precious name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. So turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians, the fifth chapter. Galatians chapter 5, and I'd like to begin our study this evening that we have entitled, Wait for the Hope of Righteousness by Faith. We want to begin with verse number 1. Galatians 5, starting with verse 1, the Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us freed, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you how much? Nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by law, you are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for something. What do we wait for? The hope of righteousness by faith. And the Apostle Paul, you notice, he did not say that we are waiting for righteousness by faith. We are waiting for what? The hope of righteousness by faith. And in that statement there, you have the idea of the hope of the Christian connected directly with the phrase righteousness by faith. We don't have to wait for righteousness by faith. That is available to you and I at any moment of any time of any day. The everlasting gospel teaches us That God so loved us that he offers this wondrous plan to how much of humanity? All humanity. So we don't have to wait for righteousness by faith. The reality is that God's loving plan of the everlasting gospel, we call it righteousness by faith, has to wait for us in the long suffering of God as the Spirit woos our hearts and moves us along to encourage us to accept of God's loving plan. So we do not wait for righteousness by faith. What we do is we wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. 
And if you were to study that word, wait, it's an active word. What kind of word is it? It's an active word. And it's a word that if you were to not only look up the definition of the word, it's a verb in the original language. And if you were to parse it a little bit, you would find out that that word wait is, this is going to be exciting, are you ready for it? Is in the second person plural. And I can tell all of you are just smiling real. Isn't that amazing? Second, and what that simply means, the Apostle Paul is saying, you wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. He's not saying you as an individual, but he's saying you plural. He's pointing to all who have accepted the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying you, if you have, if the, if the love of God reverberates in your heart and mind, then you are to wait actively and eagerly look for the hastening and the hope of everlasting life. And uh, in, as you study the New Testament, this hope is described as the hope of the resurrection morning, the hope of the end of this world, and heaven to come, the hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ. When the Apostle Paul stood before King Agrippa, he told him, I am here because of the hope that has been given to the forefathers of this grand family of God. And that hope is the second coming of Christ. Before that, he spoke to a guy named Festus. And before Festus to Felix, and you remember when he was before Felix, he says, I'm standing here for the hope that I have, that God will come and will judge both the good and the bad. And how did that make Felix feel? Not very good. And before that, he spoke to the brethren in the Sanhedrin who had called him up, were going to condemn him. And he said, I'm here. My brethren, he says, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and I am here for the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And what did it do to that council at the Sanhedrin? It had exploded it. And so the great hope that the Apostle Paul writes here to the believers in the city of Galatia is that hope of the second coming. The grand getting up morning, he said, we have this hope that burns in our hearts and it's a hope that is founded on righteousness by faith. This hope of righteousness by faith is established and firm only through the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 there says, for through what? The Spirit we wait for, the hope of righteousness by faith. Some might say, how is it that I can have this eagerness? This act, this word is an active eagerness, an active looking forward to. How can I wait like that? You can if the Spirit of God is reverberating in your heart and life. You can if Jesus is your focus. And if that happens in your and my life, then first, verse number one, the verb there becomes reality because it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So righteousness by faith here in Galatians chapter 5 is not only something that enables us to eagerly wake, wait and earnestly look forward to, but empowers us to stand for Christ. Stand in the freedom that he offers to each one of us. And again, that word stand is an amazing word. It again is first person plural. And it, it's a meaning for everybody. And both these words, both these active verbs of stand and wait is in a, there's a thing in the Greek language that's called moods. We don't have that in the English language. And sometimes there's the imperative mood, which is a command. This one here, both stand and wait, it's not in the, in imperative mood, but it's in something called the indicative mood, which just simply means that this is action taking place based on something that is real and actual, based on the evidence and facts at hand. 
And so, if Christ is reigning in our hearts, then the reality is, the, re the real thing is, is that we will be able to actively and eagerly wait and look for the second coming. And we will be able to stand up for him in the challenges in the world that we have. And along with this, can you think of any other places where you see things standing up or standing fast when God steps into the picture? Turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 33. You're going to hold a marker or your finger there in Galatians still. But we want to go now to Psalm the 33rd chapter. And let's look at verses 6 through 9. Psalm 33, starting with verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. How were the heavens made? By the word of God, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters uh, of the sea together as in a heap. He lays up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand how? In awe of him, for he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it did what? Stood fast. And so, if you and I are wondering how in the world am I going to be able to stand fast in this world, well, if God can speak and things come into existence and they come forth and stand fast, if God can do that through his word, he can do anything. I don't know about you, I sometimes have a problem standing for God. When I was a young boy, I used to read these uh, peanut strips. You know, these conversations between Charlie Brown and Lucy. And uh, one peanut strip, this is a long time ago, but one peanut strip had Charlie Brown and Lucy were discussing theology. And Lucy says to Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown, on the great cruise ship life, some take their deck chairs to the bow to look ahead and see where they're going. Charlie Brown, some take their deck chairs to the stern to look behind to see where they have been. Charlie Brown, where do you place your deck chair? And without missing a beat, Charlie Brown said, Lucy, I can't get my deck chair unfolded. And sometimes I feel like that, don't you? And so we ask ourselves the question, Lord, how is it that I can wait and eagerly look forward to what you have prepared for me? How can I stand in days like these? How can I stand not only in days like these, but just to live responsible in my own house and at the school or the university or at church? How is that possible? And God steps forward, I love you with an everlasting love. And I will feel, if you accept my loving plan, I will fill you with my spirit. And you'll stand. It's indicative. It's something that is a fact, a reality, based on the evidence of just simply what God will do. I can remember the first time when I considered God's word. Here we see the picture that he simply commanded and it did stand fast. I can remember when I first started reading this book that we call the Bible. I was 10 years old. And it was the summer of 1971. And I got up early in the morning because I wanted to read my uncle's Bible. I was staying with my uncle. He was my caregiver. I was born in Seattle, Washington. And on the day of my birth, uh, became a ward of the court of the state of Washington and uh, was a ward of the court until I turned 18, lived with 16 different homes, and home number 16 was my Uncle Warney and Aunt Ginger, who I call mom and dad today. And they took me in and loved me as their own, and because of that decision and God's blessing, my life was spared. And so, a little while after they took me in, some faithful members of the Kent Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Washington Conference were, doing door, were knocking on doors in the neighborhood there, the Lee, Lee Hills Housing Project. 
that would become known as living in the hood. We called it the hood. And they were knocking on the doors and uh, came to our door and said, we're inviting you to church. That was their approach. You know, we're just going around the neighborhood inviting people to church. And my dad, he said, I work on Sunday. That's not going to work. And, all, and, that, and that man was sharp who knocked on the door and he said, well, I got good news. Amen. Yeah. See, our, our services are on Saturday. And aunt and uncle and family, you know, we had been thinking about wanting to go to church, I guess. I don't really remember, but I guess that's what my mom and dad tell me. And so we started attending the Kent Seventh-day Adventist Church down in downtown Kent, Kent on State and Gow. And uh, that church became a special part of our life. And so I started listening to these guys that would stand up at a place like this and read from this black book. And after a little while, I said to my uncle, can I have one of those books that the, that man up there reads out of? And my uncle said, well, that's the Bible. And I said, well, I'm okay with that. It doesn't matter to me what you call it. Um, can I have one? And he said, well, we got to save up some money for that. And so he was doing that. And while he was saving up money, he'd get up early in the morning to head down to the garbage company. And I'd hear that old Dodge pickup with that diesel engine, Cummins engine start up, loud as it is. And uh, it would wake me up in the morning. And I would sneak up from my bedroom downstairs. I'd sneak upstairs to his nightstand where he had his Bible. I'd take his Bible and go downstairs and turn on my light and read. And I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know much about God. I was beginning to learn. And so I just began where you do at all books. Began at the beginning there at this first book that I pronounced Genesis. <laughs> and I read through it the first time. And these amazing stories of creation and the flood and these guys that live 700, 800, 900 years old and the stories of Abraham, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, that was pretty amazing to my 10-year-old mind. And when I got done reading the book of Genesis the first time, I went back and read it again. I enjoyed it so much. And that summer I read through the Old Testament as a 10-year-old. And when I got through the book of Genesis the second time, I said my first prayer. I got down on my knees, skinny knees on a concrete floor, on a house on Rainier Avenue on the south side of Seattle. I said my first prayer. I said, God, I don't know for sure if the things that I'm reading are true, but I'm just letting you know that I would like to believe that they are. And a presence came into that little boy's room. And at first it scared me. Because I looked around and there was no one there. But there was someone there. And I felt a hug. And I felt a peace in my 10 year old mind and heart that I had never felt before. And I began, I got up off my knees and sat down on my bed and opened up God's word and continued to read, knowing that what I had just, what I had just read was true. Amen. And so in this word, we understand that it has power. And it tells us of this grand story of how God sent his only begotten son to show us the love of the Father and to redeem us from how much sin? All sin, the Bible says. That is the power of the everlasting gospel. And that's what the book of Galatians, by the way, is all about. There are some folk who look at the book of Galatians and they say, they say, well, uh, I wonder uh, what the book of Galatians, I wonder what churches he's, he's writing to. And you can read stuff on Galatians that's this thick, talking about, well, is he writing to the churches in the south part of Asia Minor or the north part of Asia Minor? And when I read the book of Galatians, it's written to all the churches that are in Galatia. And so it's a message not for the south side or the north side, it's a message for everyone. 
And then some folk come along and say, well, what law is, uh, is the subject of the book of Galatians? And throughout Christendom, debates and papers and books have been written as to what law is the subject of the book of Galatians. In the great Advent movement, there was some discussion on that too. But one of our early Advent pioneers wrote, an art, wrote a statement on July 25, 1899. Letters had come into the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald saying, what law is talked about in the, is the point in the book of Galatians? And the answer was simply, no law. That's not what it's about. It's about the everlasting gospel. In the book of Galatians, the subject is solely salvation by grace, not by law. By faith, not by works. By spirit, not by flesh. By Christ, not by self. The everlasting gospel is the heartbeat of this book. Now I'm going to show you this, so turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to what? Another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be what? A curse. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other what? Gospel unto you, other than that which you have received, let him be a curse. Notice verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. So as you read through the introduction of this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers in all of Galatia, you see very clearly, is it talking about debates of which church he is writing to? No. Is it talking about debates of law? No. What's it talking about? The gospel. A true gospel as opposed to a false gospel. Notice chapter 2 verse 2. The Bible says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that what? That gospel. Notice verse 5 of chapter 2. To whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Verse 7. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel uh, of circumcision was unto Peter, and the text goes on there. Notice chapter 3. Verse 8. And the scripture foreseeth that God would justify the heathen through faith, preach before what? The gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. You go over to chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you first. And then you head on over to chapter 6. As you read the conclusion, the word gospel is not mentioned. But notice chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Rather twisted, wasn't it? But God forbid that I should glory save in what? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And so, from the beginning of this letter to the end of this letter, the theme of the everlasting gospel is thread all the way through. And when you look at that word gospel, euangelion is the word, in every case here, well, I think in 10 or 11 of the 12 cases, it's it's in verbal form. And so it's talking about the euangelion, that is the good news, that is active. That is moving. That has power. And it's that type of gospel that is needed in the church today. Amen. And when we see how powerful this gospel is, 
we will begin to realize all the good things that God wants to do for us. So I'd like to take a couple more looks now in Galatians of what it looks like to have this gospel, this righteousness by faith in our lives. Notice chapter 1. I'm going to read the first four verses now. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by who? Jesus Christ. And from who? God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for whose sins? Our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and the Father. And so, here you have the picture where the Apostle Paul, writing to the believers in Galatia, first of all, he says, this grace, this everlasting gospel, comes from Jesus Christ and God the Father. And when you get to the end of the book of Galatians, chapter 5, you read about how the Holy Spirit then comes marching in. With those who accept Christ, the Spirit then fills us and gives us power and gives us the fruit of the Spirit to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. And so this everlasting gospel message comes from the God family, comes from those three heavenly powers of the heavenly trio. It's from God the Father. It's from Jesus Christ. And it's from the Spirit of God. It's a complete plan with all power in the universe. And that's good news for you and I. The trouble is, is that some folk are coming along in the Christian world, and in my opinion, trying to cause trouble. They're coming along, and they're putting their tweaks and twists on the purity of the everlasting gospel. I think one of those tweaks is the idea that when we talk about salvation, when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about righteousness by faith, that it is Jesus only. Or Jesus stop. One stop. Or Jesus all. Or just Jesus. I don't read that anywhere in the New Testament. Amen. Jesus Christ came to show us the love of the Father. And when he took the likeness of sinful flesh on planet Earth, he needed to pray to his Heavenly Father. And the Bible says that he didn't do anything except for through who? His Father. And then when he left, when he died and rose again, he promised, well, before he died and rose again, he promised his followers that, and you read it in John 16, that it was expedient for him to leave. And you look up that word expedient, it means necessary. This is what has to take place so that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, can come and be with you, walk right beside you, and to lead and guide you into how much truth? All truth. And so the picture is not just Jesus, only Jesus. The picture is the entire God family. And the Bible teaches us all the angels of heaven working in our behalf to save us from our sin. And this God family then sends us something. Notice verse 3 says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And so God gives us two things here, grace and peace. And you say, well, wait a second, that's just a calm, ing calm ingredient. And it's true, uh, back in the first century, when people greeted each other, they would say, charis, which is grace. Uh, and that is what the uh, Gentile, the Greek world would say. And uh, the, Jew the Jews would say, they would greet each other with this word peace. Uh, in the Hebrew language, shalom. But what Paul is writing here is connected to what God is doing for humanity. So this is just not a, only a simple greeting. greeting. Uh, uh, Paul does write greetings to the different churches. But here he's simply, God is, he's saying, God is not, 
walking by saying, hey, what God is doing here is he is offering his grace. Why? Because he is gracious. He's offering his peace. Why? Because he is the prince of peace. And this loving heavenly father gave us a gift. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil wor world according to the will of God and the Father. So is it God's will that we be delivered from all the evil, all the pain, all the tribulation, all the trials, all the stuff out there in pop culture around the world? Is it God's will to deliver us from that? Yes. yes. Some folk come walking along and say, well, you know, God loves us and he accepts us just the way we are and that's it. The Bible doesn't teach that that's it. The Bible teaches that he gave his son to redeem us from sin and from this evil world. But you know what? We have to be careful with that thought because here it's not really talking about the evil that is out there. That's not the main emphasis here. Because this phrase, who gave himself for our sins. So whose sin is it again? It's my sin. And it's your sin. This phrase, he gave himself for our sin, is in the Greek structure directly connected to this phrase of its being God's will to deliver us from evil in the world. So it's not specifically talking about the evil out there. It's talking about the evil in where? Here. And so as the Apostle Paul describes it, he lets us know up front that our Heavenly Father gave His Son, gave His life for our sins. And not only gave his life for our sins, but now is able to deliver us from that sin and the evil that's embedded in our own hearts. And that's power. We go over to Galatians chapter 2. I want to look at verses 16, 17, and 18. Galatians, the second chapter, we get another amazing picture of God's power here. Notice it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law. And so is a man justified by works of the law? No. And by the way here, this word for law, in my Bible and probably in your Bibles, it has the definite article there, works of the law. But uh, in uh, the Greek language here, the definite article is not there. It's just ergon namas, works of law. So it's not talking about a specific law. It's talking about law in general. And so the Apostle Paul is coming along. And he's making it very plain. Law does not save us. It cannot justify us. It cannot make us righteous. It cannot pardon us. And did God give laws to mankind? Indeed. And what kind of laws did he give? Gave the Ten Commandment law, the moral law. Gave the ceremonial law. Gave the health laws. Gave the civil laws. And what the Apostle Paul is simply saying is that works of law. Can the civil law justify anybody? Can the health laws justify anybody? Can God's moral law justify anybody? No. All these laws have their purpose, but they can't justify us and make us righteous. You know? And so the Apostle Paul making it very plain. No. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of law, but by what? Faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified 
by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so we have that side of the powerful picture. I believe it's a powerful picture where God says, I put together a plan, and if you have faith and trust and belief in my only begotten Son, you will be justified. Look up the word justified. It means righteous. Amen. It means pardon. Yes. It means forgiveness. Yes. And so when I get down on my knees for the first time and say, Lord, will you be merciful to me, a sinner? What's the promise? If I confess my sin, he is what? faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And in heaven, my name is written in the book of life. We call that the forensic, the legal form of righteousness. But it doesn't stay in heaven. It's something then that can actually do something inside me. My heart's in my tongue. How do I know that's true? Because in verse 17 it says, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, and are we seeking that? Yes. Amen. If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? And what's the answer? Yeah, yeah God forbid. So the Apostle Paul is just simply saying, if you have accepted Christ, you are justified uh, through him. And if that's the case, you are not going to live your lives in active sin. If you look at that word sinners, it's this active lifestyle. This con it's in continuous sense. You're not going to be doing that. You know? Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. And then verse 18, the clincher. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself what? A transgressor. And so there's the full picture right there in just those few verses. Through the power of the everlasting gospel, I'm justified by faith in Christ. Not only that, he then grants me the power to be able to not build again the things that have been torn down can walk in faithfulness and obedience to Christ day by day. And this is the message that the Apostle Paul shared to the believers in Galatia. It was for them in the first century. But we also understood and read that it was not only preached here, but it was preached way back in the time of who? Time of Abraham. The word there, where it says, before, uh, before in the times of Abraham, it's the act of euangelion there, with a, what's a, what do you call it in that language? You know, a prefix, that which goes, it's pro euangelizo. And that act of words was the gospel preached before, way back then. And so it was for them. It's been for the whole world for how long? For always, since we fell into sin. And it's for us in the 21st century. This everlasting gospel is talked about in a last day context. Go to Revelation chapter 14 with me. Revelation the 14th chapter. We have 20 verses there. We're going to read all of No, we're not going to read all of them. Revelation 14. And there are three sections in this chapter. And a little bit of context. You remember that in Revelation 12, God showed the Apostle John this picture of the great controversy between the devil and the church. And then in Revelation chapter 13, you have the devil's plan of attack. In Revelation chapter 14, you have God's plan of attack. And whose plan wins? God wins. I had a professor back at the seminary. I took a class on Revelation from him. And at the beginning, on the first day of class, he told our whole class. He said, uh, I can sum up the book of Revelation in two words. And I'm sitting back on, there's no way. You know, 
Take a look at all that's in the, you know, take a look at the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven last plagues. You take a look at that whole picture. You can't sum that up in two words. And he even asked us, you guys sit down and write in your Bibles a couple of words that you think sums it up. I couldn't do it. And after a few minutes when we got done writing, he just looked at us and said, gentlemen, God wins. Yes. And I thought, oh, that's good. Write that down. I'm going to share it until Jesus comes. You know? So, and so, God wins. The great controversy theme in Revelation 12, devil's plan of attack in Revelation 13, God's plan of attack in Revelation 14. Who wins? God does. He won from the very beginning. He's going to win finally at the end. And so he gives this message of the everlasting gospel all through time on planet earth not only Paul not only for you it's for us in the 21st century too and notice verse number one says John says and, and I looked and lo a lamb stood on Mount Zion with him who the hundred and forty four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads and so you take a look at the first five verses and it describes this last day people who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And then the last portion of the chapter, if you look at verses 15 and 16, it says, well, I'm going to go up a verse. Verse 14, And I looked and behold a what color cloud? White. Upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle, and another angel came out of the temple crying with what kind of voice? Wow. To him that sat on the cloud, thrust in the sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And so the beginning of Revelation chapter 14 mentions a group of people called the 144,000. They follow Jesus. Amen. And the end of the chapter describes what event on planet earth? The harvest and the second coming of Christ. And then in between the description of this last day people just before the harvest of planet earth in between there is a message connected to the people just before the harvest and that message is what verse 6 I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having something having what the everlasting gospel that's euangelion there again in its active sense the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And it goes on describing that. And so the simple point is this. God showed John at the end of the first century as he is a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, shows him that John, at the end of time, way on down the line, I'm going to have a group of people, we're going to call them the 144,000. They have their father's name written in their foreheads. They reflect the character of, God's in, of God in their minds. And they have his law in their hearts. And wherever Jesus asks them to go, what do they do? They move, they go. They're waiting actively. They're standing firm for him. And John, those people are going to have a special message at that end time context right before the earth is harvested. And that three angels message starts out with the preaching of what? 
the everlasting gospel. It's the foundation of all three messages. The everlasting gospel connected to the judgment hour message. By the way, the only way you can really understand the everlasting gospel and the judgment hour message is to study something that the Bible calls the sanctuary. It's the best way to understand it. Get the whole picture. And the everlasting gospel says, worship him. The everlasting gospel says, avoid Babylon. It will lead nowhere. Nothing but confusion. And avoid the beast and its mark like you would the plague. That's the entire message. And the everlasting gospel is its foundation. So question, is this everlasting gospel, this powerful message of righteousness by faith in Christ, is that alive in the 21st century for you and I? Yes. yes. And it's, it is our message. With all three messages there, it's the foundation of our hope. It's our mission. It's our task. It's our vision. And if anybody comes along and says, well, we don't need to talk about all three. And we know that ain't the truth. It's not what God told the Apostle John. And as you read through the book of Revelation and understand how history has unfolded, is this going to take place and happen? You betcha. And you and I, we have the privilege of being a part of it. This train is going through. I just soon be on board. What about you? Amen. That's the power of the everlasting gospel in the context of a three angels messages and there's all kinds of stuff in the Christian world and in the great advent movement today that's trying to get us off track I don't have time to our times wrapping up and there's a few things I want to get to but let me say this I've had the privilege of being a pastor in this great advent movement for almost 30 years now I've heard a lot of stuff. And if it doesn't jive with the word of God or the spirit of prophecy, we have no time for it. Amen. What we have time for is the fervent study of God's word Amen. and the spirit of prophecy and understanding for ourselves what God wants to do for us. And so what does this everlasting gospel, this message of righteousness by faith, look like from a practical standpoint? Let's go back to the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians, the first four chapters describe what you and I might call the theology of the everlasting gospel, the theology of justification by faith or righteousness by faith. First four chapters discuss this theology so that we can have a true and pure intellectual understanding in our minds on what it's all about. And then chapters 5 and 6 describe and give some pictures of what righteousness by faith looks like from a practical standpoint in the life. And we need to understand that I cannot make this message practically until I understand it intellectually. So we need both. Amen? Because one of the things coming down the pike, it's been coming down the pike for a while, is we don't necessarily need to focus so much on doctrine. We just need to focus on Jesus. And there's a de-emphasis on God's word and the doctrines of scripture. And we just focus on one thing, dealing with maybe experience. And we need to have an experience, but we can't have an experience until we understand what we can. And so in chapters 5 and 6, what does it look like practically to have this everlasting gospel reverberating in my heart and in yours? What does it look like? Well, we already read two things. Chapter 5, verse 1, stand fast. So how many of you, under the, by the grace of God, want to say tonight, I want to stand fast? Amen. Amen. Not only that, in verse 5, for we through the Spirit of God... Wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. They have that hope, the second coming, righteousness by faith, connected and with the Spirit helps us to actively wait, to eagerly look for. What does it mean to have the everlasting gospel in my life? Righteousness by faith. It means to eagerly look for that great hope. And I can't if righteousness by faith is not a reality in my life. 
What else does it look like? Are you ready to get practical here? Amen. Let's continue, continue down the text. Chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, he's talking to the church folk. You've been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love do what? Serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. So one of the things it looks like is that the church will treat each other. The members of the church will treat each other with love and respect. How many times in church history have members fought with each other? Yelled at each other? Looked at each other the wrong way? Or maybe something happened and it kind of set you off because we're living on the edge. That's not the spirit-filled life. You know? What does it look like practically? It looks like the golden rule that I'm going to love one another, love my brother or my sister in Christ and I'm going to treat them as I would want them to treat me. Amen. Go on through the text. What does it look like? It means to walk in the spirit. And when we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And some folks say, well, we really don't know what that means. Yes, we do. Because the lusts of the flesh are listed there in verses 17, 18, and 19, and 20, and 21. And those that do such thing, are they going to be in the kingdom of heaven? No. Well, we don't know. What do you mean by the fruits, of the, the walking after the life of the Spirit? Well, just read it. <laughs> it means that love will take the place of anger. It means that there will be joy and peace in my life. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These type of things will be in my life at home, not only in church. You continue on. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, do what? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. And there's another number of action words in this chapter. But one other thing it looks like to have the gospel in our lives, to have righteousness by faith in our hearts and our minds, is to when we see someone else stubble in the church, what are we supposed to do? Restore. And Christ gave direction on how we were to restore. There's no command here or anywhere in the Bible that when we see one of our brothers and sisters stumble and fall, that we condemn them or that we talk about them or their sin. What's the message? We restore. And we restore with the spirit of meekness. And that doesn't come to you and me by nature. You know, and we are to consider ourselves as well. Those who are spiritual are to restore. That's what righteousness by faith looks like in the life. And that is a little bit of the power that God offers to us. One of the pictures of power that we see in the book of Revelation is over in Revelation chapter 6. Because this power is not something that is offered to us just at one point in time. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. Starting with verse number 1. The Bible says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, saying what? Come and see. And I saw him, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth doing what? Conquering, Conquering to conquer. <laughs> and so, as uh, John writes down this grand vision that he saw from God, through Jesus, through the angel, sees this picture 
of one seal, the first seal being lifted from that scroll. And when he sees that, he sees the rider of the white horse of the book of Revelation going forth with a bow and a crown on his head. That crown is the Stephanus crown, a victory crown. So with the crown and the bow, it symbolizes conquest and victory. And John is writing down, God, God took, write it down, John, that from the beginning of the gospel era to the end of the gospel era, the rider of the white horse rides forth conquering and to conquer. And when you read Revelation chapter 19, we find out who the rider of the white horse is. You know, he has the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. None other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ riding forth. Have you ever wondered why it's, I've wondered this, why didn't it just say he's riding forth, going out to conquer? But instead it says he's riding forth, going out, conquering and to conquer. I thought that's kind of a strange, awkward phrase. And so I did a little work on that. So we look up this word conquer and the other word conquer, do a little bit of uh, a study of the structure there. And let me share with you, we got a few more minutes here, something that is going to be amazing. Your eyes are going to light up. You, if you do a study on this, you know what you're going to find out? This is what you're going to find out. This phrase, conquering and to conquer, is a present participle followed by a subjunctive. Yes. <laughs> and what that simply means is it sends the message of a continuous action. And it's the idea that Christ at the beginning of the gospel area, he goes out con to conquer. And he will continue to conquer until there's absolutely nothing left to conquer. Amen. Amen. And it's that type of message that God has given to you and to me. It's the type of message that is worth praying about in our own hearts and in our own minds. It's a message of the power of of the everlasting gospel of righteousness by faith in Christ that justifies me and sanctifies me and one day will glorify me the power of the gospel shows me in John 3:16 and Romans 5:8 that for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son and that God commended his love toward me in that while I was yet a sinner, what happened? Christ died for me. It's a power that shows me in the book of Jude, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. With what kind of joy? With exceeding joy to the only wise God our, be glory and majesty power and dominion for how long forever and ever and so I have decided what about you I've decided to accept God's loving plan in my life to change the way I think to change the way I feel to purify my character I've decided that I, the decision has been made and I've stepped over the line so I'm not gonna look back let up slow down or back away because my past has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, which makes my present make sense and my future secure as I continue to trust in Him. And by His grace, I'm willing to say, and I hope you are too, that I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap giving and dwarfed goals and with the Spirit of God dwelling in our hearts we can stand up and say I no longer need preeminence prosperity position promotion plaudits popularity I don't have to be first tops recognized praised regarded or rewarded because I now live by faith lean on his presence, walk with patience, live by prayer, and labor with power. Amen.
With God at my side, I can say my face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions may be few, but thank God Almighty, my guide is reliable. Therefore, my mission and my vision is clear. I cannot be bought or sold. I cannot be compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. And with the Spirit of God reverberating in our hearts and our minds, we can stand up and say, I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder in the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. And with the help of God, I'm not going to give up, let up, or shut up Amen. until I have stayed up, prayed up, stored up, paid up, and spoken up for the cause of Christ. I must go till he comes. Amen? Amen. Give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will recognize us. Amen. We are part of those who are standing firm and actively waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, oh Lord, we want to thank you so much for the privilege that we have had to consider your word in this meeting. And we have touched base on just some of the general pictures of this loving and wonderful plan to redeem us from our sins, to show us the love of the Father, and to lead us according to your will. And oh, Father, it's our heart's desire that we would be found with our eyes focused on Jesus Christ and him crucified, and our feet planted firmly on your word in the spirit of prophecy, until the great day that you come, and when you come, we want to be standing firm and waiting for that grand hope we ask in the name of Jesus, who has made it all possible. Amen.